loving Heavenly Father, as we study your word today, please open our minds to the thoughts that you want us to think and uh, help us to remember those things that you give us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When it comes to the binding up, part of the story is the Mara vision. And I know that what Mark began to set forth about the binding up yesterday, we're, we're trying to settle other issues in that right now than the Mara. So discussing the Mara isn't going to jump ahead on him. But I'm going to lead in real slowly today. This will kind of be more of a lecture day because I'm fitting it in on the spur of the moment than anything else. But I'm going to, I'm going to go to John chapter 4 and start there. Because the, the, the only thing that I really want to take from there is the first witness that a well, prophetically, is a, is a point where there is a... There, the, the well, prophetically, is going to mean lots of stuff, but one of the things that it represents is it's a place that is being emphasized as a point in the prophetic narrative that you need to wrap your mind around what's represented by the well. Because I'm going to go to the well of Beersheba, and argue that Beersheba is, you know, directly connected with the covenant, the seven times of Leviticus 26. But Beersheba is also half of the symbol of Beersheba to Dan, which is identifying the history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. The history where the eleventh hour workers are getting plowed and awakened to what's going to take place at the Sunday law. And the history where the Levites are coming and joining the priests. Okay, so that's part of the story of Beersheba. But to understand the significance of Beersheba, we want to argue that a well is a symbol of something that's marking a significant thing. In Beersheba, beer means well. Well of the seven times. So, the reason I'm taking time to go there is because before we really get to where we're heading, we'll also go to the first reference of Beersheba in the scriptures, and it's with Ishmael, when Abraham sends him away, he ends up, he and his wife, Hagar, uh, and they dis it's the first reference, they're in the wilderness of Beersheba, and they, they come across this well, which, I don't know that, maybe Sister White directly sails it, but the inference is this is the well of Beersheba, because they're in the wilderness of Beersheba. So, people don't make the connection, generally, this message is the only one that has made this connection that I know of, but Islam is symbolized by Ishmael, and Ishmael, you know, he wasn't a, a Muslim, he didn't worship based upon the Quran, that doesn't come in until Muhammad, so there's, there's some breaks about they have to acknowledge between Ishmael and radical Islam. But nevertheless, Ishmael in that history, the part that isn't often recognized, is a symbol. Islam becomes a symbol of those people that try to do public evangelism in a time when they're supposed to stay in their tents. So it's marking, when we mark the arrival of Islam on 9-11, it's marking the history when Christ is confirming his covenant with many for one week. And so you want to put that in place before you go to the very first place where the word Mara occurs, which is in Genesis 46. And it's when Jacob is coming into Egypt because of the famine. And he brings 70 people with him. But right before he gets to Egypt, he goes to Beersheba. And at Beersheba, he has the first reference to the Mara vision there before he then goes into Egypt. And I think he goes into Egypt at the Midnight Cry. Anyone wants to correct that, you can. And I think the 70 there isn't a symbol of the beginning or the ending. It's a symbol of the whole history where the Levites are brought in and the Samaritans are awakened. Um, so I think you have to see that. You have to have to see... Beersheba in the context of that it is the well of the oath, the well of the seven times. <clears throat> See all those connections 
to understand what it means that Jacob has the first Mara vision right before he goes down into Egypt. So that's that's kind of what we're going to track, and I think we can we can do that without. <clears throat> getting Mark or Tamina or anyone behind on, on the flow of things we're doing because I'm intending to stay on the binding off until the prophecy school starts because that seems like an issue everyone wants to resolve either for the book of Esther maybe you're resolved on what you plan on doing with Daniel 10 I don't know based upon yesterday's but in any case in John chapter 4 we could we could probably just talk ourselves through this um, but let's read verses 7 through 38. There's just a couple points that I want to draw out of here. And, <clears throat> you know, as I think of some people that, in a, that are fighting this message that have been involved with this message or whatever, they're learning this message, not fighting it, but they got these, you know, learning curves they're dealing with. Generally, when... For what I've noticed, and I think it's true, someone starts arguing that they're not getting this point. Nine out of ten times, the reason they're not getting this point is they didn't catch the previous plateau of logic that prepares for this point. And when someone's really not getting it, sometimes you have to go backwards to to the you know the very fundamental uh, point of reference. And one of the fundamental points of reference that, that you have to learn for yourself, you know, you can come into a class like this and you can hear the logic of it and you can say, yes, I get it. I can tell that's true. And lots of Seventh-day Adventists and Seventh-day Adventists for that reason. I've heard them give them their public testimony for that. And I've seen people that do it. They, they're searching for God's true church and they, they finally get connected with Adventists that take them down through the fundamental truths of what Adventists believe, and they can say, hey, this is biblical, this is sound, this is the true church. I want to become part of the true church, and they become part of the true church because of the logic. But they never actually spent the time to investigate those doctrines that were presented to them and testing them and make them their own. Okay, so I'm telling you, one of the fundamental ones <clears throat> that you have to make your own, if you if you accept this simply because you see the logic, but you haven't made it your own. It, you don't really understand the significance of this, and it's that all the prophets and all the prophetic testimony takes place here at the end of the world. All of it. Every, every, all the testimonies are here at the end of the world. Okay, so if you don't believe that, then you can't read verses 7 through whatever, 28, is it? 7 through 38 and derive present truth applications about what it's saying, but some of the present truth applications that are in, in here, it, we already know who's the Samaritan woman. She, yeah, so this isn't the Levites, this isn't the priests, this is the 11th hour workers that are going to come in after beginning in AD 34 with the stoning of Stephen. And... Uh, What's one of the primary issues that we'll see in here? Has to do with eating. Has to do with what? Eating. What's your even even the disciples, you know, they it's here where he's going to say, you know, I have other food that I'm eating that you know not of, because they're saying, hey, eat some literal food, okay? So and and that's this, that is one of the themes here because you have a second witness to that very theme when Christ is telling this woman. You drink that literal water and you're going to die. But if you drink spiritual water, you're going to live. That's also about what you're eating. So this is about the history of 9-11 to the Sunday Law. It's about the end of the world. And it's about the Lord preparing, plowing the 11th hour workers to come in. But the emphasis of it is that those 11th hour workers that come in and stand faithful, or the Levites that come in and stand faithful, one of the primary principles they're going to have to understand is that prophecy is figurative at the end of the world. It's not literal. And it's not a mixture of both. And that's in here. So 7 to 38 is 31. Let's do five verses each. That'll make it kind of tricky. Four verses each. 
Well, I'm not worried about the amount. I'm worried about remembering where we end. Four verses each. I'll start. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am of a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Even there, she's, she's presenting the truth that Seventh-day Adventists aren't supposed to be... Even she knows, as a Samaritan, Adventists aren't supposed to be coming to apostate Protestantism for their doctrines. Brother Paul, did I read before? No. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. One, two, three, four. Okay, Brother Paul. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto what, him, do you, What do you see in there? Do we know of a certainty what, what well this is? Yes. What Sister White says? And we have labeled it previously as Gihon, the well that springeth up forever, right? It's Gihon. This is the the spring of Gihon. The, but li literally, what well is it that Jacob's well? Yeah, what I'm saying is, at the surface level, the the only thing you could tell here is that this is a well associated with Jacob, and Jacob's the well that is associated with him is the well of Beersheba. Okay, this is where he goes to, is to Beersheba, and the well of Beersheba is are the wells that Abraham and Isaac struggle with the what are they called? Palestine. I think it might have been Philistines, but the the father Abimelech. You, Abimelech. Uh, you, you can figure it out um, because it says that he's yeah. in the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. So wherever Sychar is, then you can yeah, you find can where figure he it out. made a well there. We could see. All right. Not right now, but soon. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered, What's it about? Oh, marriage. It's right there, the midnight cry. Go ahead. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that, in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive, perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor ye at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Um, there, go ahead. This is five one right here. It says mm -hmm. you had five husbands, and now you're with a guy who's not your husband. Mm -hmm. And she's at the midnight cry, so it almost seems like that same as the five months and the one month. Kind of, um, it puts you. If she's standing at the midnight cry and she has one, past tense, she had five. Perhaps, perhaps that's right. Yeah. But she's all, he's also bringing in here, literal and spiritual. Yeah. yeah. With Jerusalem. Whose turn? But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. 
When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So, when's Messiah come? 9-11. His baptism is pointed to 9-11. So she, she must know something about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here as a Samaritan. But anyway, Brother Gabriel? And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the man, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is, it, is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So in... Uh Wales, and I think Mark's done it before, but at least in Wales he does a presentation where, I think he's, he had to have done it here too, the sign of Jonah. Where he's, he's doing it at Cami. Doing it to Cami, where, where you, you, you go through and you show that each of these way marks, the sign associated with them. The sign the priests have to see is Islam at 9-11, the sign that the Levites have to see is Islam at the midnight cry, and the sign that the 11 hour workers are going to see is Islam at the Sunday law because it's always the same sign for this generation um, she's acknowledging that here she's she's saying that uh, she knows this guy's the Messiah based upon the fact that he pro he's told me things about my life that no one could know so she in but she's putting it in the context that he's the Christ he's the Messiah so she's acknowledging the sign of 9-11 which is also the sign of the midnight cry sign of the Sunday law um, She's being prepared for the Sunday law. Clouds. Sikar means strong drink or intoxicant, alcoholic liquor, drunkard, strong one. The place where they're standing. I, mean, I was trying to find where it was at, but I, all I found was the definition. So, so st standing there, we know that at the midnight cry, you've got feasts by these kings where there's drunken revelry going on. So yeah. um, that's the, you can still place it there. Did you finish? I think Your four? Four, yes. Your four. Your turn. In the meanwhile, his disciple, his disciple prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. <coughs> Therefore said the, said the disciples one to another, have any man brought him out to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. So what's, what's his meat? This is really cool. The disciples can't see it. So what's, what's he, Christ eating at the end of the world? The hidden manna. Okay, and uh, he's uh, he's defining what the hidden manna is to eat it what it means to eat it is to do the will of him that sent him okay so this is the issue in this history of the priests is everyone claims to eat the little book but when it comes to going to Ezekiel 2 and 3 and Jeremiah 15, where the eating of the little book is defining, defined as doing the will of God and carrying a message exclusively to Adventism, this is where they rebel. And Jesus is saying that is what the eating of the little book is. So, um, we'll... Who's turned for the next four, Brown? Or ten times? Or vice versa. Tanya? Okay. Say ye not there yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Okay. Explain that. Based upon the fact that we're, we're at least suggesting, and we believe that this is the midnight cry where this is going on, I explain verse 35. It's 120, right? Yeah. So they're in the time 20. of the four months. They're in the, they're in the time. They're of at the, the they're at the end of the four months, but 
because the form okay, of you guys are being high. you guys are being myopic. You're bad. saying the four months is from nine eleven to the midnight cry because of it. Yeah, it could be from nine eleven to the Sunday. Law. Yeah, the Sunday law. Hour worker, and we yeah. already know it's the eleventh hour based on verse twenty three. So this is the hundred and twenty from nine eleven to the Sunday law. And Moses died when he was hundred and twenty. Yeah. And we can put his yeah, death is. at the midnight cry. Because Moses is replaced by what's his name? Joshua. Joshua. And who else died at that same year, but was 123? Aaron. Aaron, and he was replaced by Eliezer. And Eliezer is the Hebrew for Lazarus in the Greek. And Lazarus is resurrected right there at that way mark. But you can also place it all the way to the Sunday law. That because when Moses died, 120 years old, was at the end of the 40 years wandering, and they go into Jericho, the Sunday law. Yeah. So you can put it both ways. Is that how you justify doing that? Yeah, that, that, that you can, that's it's not justify, time. that's how I approach it logically. Is, is, and I, I do it because that's what I taught when I was teaching these covenant lines. It's there, the 120 is there. It's there, it's practical. So in one aspect, she represents this woman at the well, the. 11th hour worker and another she's the Levite Levites depending okay you guys those those thoughts may be right and I don't care if we throw these thoughts in the mix I'll remind you that all I'm trying to do here is show that a well in the scriptures represents a place a, a purposeful marking by God that this is a place that has lots of truth connected with it and you can see as you go down here that this is so the issues that are present truth right now are, they're just dripping out of this passage. So you guys may be answering the right question, but what I'm saying here, the, keep your finger here, the answer I'm looking for is Hosea 10, 12. Hosea 10, 12 says, Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. So, this, what's this verse telling us? How do you, what's it mean to break up your fallow ground? Power. Power. Okay, what's it? What you say? Plow. To plow it. In the next verse, we'll say it says you plowed wickedness, but um, what is it to sow? To plant seed, right? Okay. And what's it mean to rain? Okay, the point, this verse is marking three things that happen simultaneously. A plowing, a sowing, and a raining. Okay, so if you go back to John 4, 20, 35, it says it's marking when the harvest is. And at these waymarks, the midnight cry, the Sunday law, you have a harvest. Wh wh who's being harvested at the midnight cry? The who? Priests. The priests. Okay, who's, who has been previously plowed? The Levites. The Levites, okay, the, the plowing's been going on. What is the seed that takes place at the midnight cry? The persecution of the priests. Persecution because... A seed is the blood of the martyrs, mm -hmm. but it's also a message, right? There's a right. specific message at the midnight cry, and you got a double witness to that because that message receives what? Rain, right? Yeah, yeah. It all happens right there. Rain. So when it, he's saying to her, "There are four months to the harvest," you can show the 120 ends at the midnight cry. You can show 120 ends at the Sunday law. But no matter whether she's a Levite or 11th hour worker here, he's emphasizing that, yeah, there's a harvest coming, but there's a harvest that's taking place right here that's ready. Go ahead. Also, when it says, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in verse 35, it says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. That's the same identical thing that happens back in Genesis 24. Isaac and Rebekah both lift up their eyes at 9-11. I think that the lifting up your eyes happens and then the four months come 
because that's what the 127 represents, is that Isaac lifts up his eyes, Rebecca lifts up their eyes. I think there's a, a current running in the scripture that you lift up your eyes at 9-11. And it's the same wording. And then Rebecca looks out onto the field, and that's what they're looking out. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. They lift up their eyes. No, that that sounds like it might fit, but you, you probably ought to find a couple more witnesses. There's three right there. Look and live. You gotta look at the brazen serpent. There's three right to... there. Rebecca, Isaac, and and this right here. Rebecca look. and Isaac is one one story. No, they both do their own lif lifting up their eyes. Re Isaac looks up and sees the camels. Rebecca looks up and she sees the, they're, the they're, bridegroom. They're looking. They're both right there. It's the same story. It's nine eleven. They're each a separate witness, though. Isaac is seeing Islam, and Rebecca seeing is seeing Christ, or the King of the North. I mean, they're they're both they're both right there because he's the true King of the North, right? Yeah. So you have Islam, the King of the North, represented the message of the East and the North. And then they and then she looks out and she sees the field, and this is the same thing. When they lift up their eyes, he sees a field too. So I think we can tie the one twenty and the one twenty seven again with this passage. My thought. What are the fields? What you just described. Yeah, but what are they? Well, there's the field of the priests, the field of the Levites, the field of the eleventh hour workers. Yes. Yeah, okay. No, they're all going to get plowed. They're all going to get sowed and rained upon. Rained upon. They're all going to get reaped. Okay. Now, finish those verses, whoever didn't, and we can move on. It was you, Rowan? I don't know. I cut you off. I didn't let you read thirty-six through thirty-eight. Okay. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is the saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Okay, so my point from all this is that wills are significant um, symbols. They're symbols in the scriptures that emphasize passages that have important, profound, complex truth. So let's go to Genesis um, and look at the first reference to Beersheba because we want to have some understanding of Beersheba when we get to the first reference of Mara. So if you go to Genesis, is it 16? Genesis 16. All right, let's uh, read verses 1 through 12. Okay, let's go to 1 through 12. Um, your turn, Brother Tyler. How many? Six. Six. And then Sister Tanya will do six. Okay. <laughs> now Sarai, Abram's, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Okay, so this is the story of, among other things, Ishmael and Hagar, right? So you'll find that one of the primary characteristics of Islam and Bible prophecy is what? Because it's already been marked at the beginning of their story, a restraint. Okay? The Lord has restrained Sarah from having children, huh? Keep going. And Sarah's, um, and Sarah's Abraham's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Uh, what are we going to do with that? Ten. It's been ten years in the land of Canaan. Go ahead. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah, oh, and Sarah said unto Abram, Why, sorry, my wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom, 
And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, and the Lord judge between me and thee. And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And Sarai dwelt, dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. The word sure, she's on her way to sure. Sure means wall. She's on her way to the wall. Right. Sure is the wall, huh? You read through verse 12? One more. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Why? What's the most important thing about verse 12 to you? Prophetically. The hand. Why is the hand? Because it's identifying a, a loose name and a restraining of Islam. His hand, he's striking things and then he gets that's a loose name and restraining. You guys gonna let him get away An with action. that? That's valid. That's valid. Brother Jeff, I came across something yesterday that I didn't know what to do with well, let's finish verse 12. Is this about verse 12? This is about Sarah. Wait a second. What's the most... It's wild not man. about the hand. The hand wild may be man. part of it. Pardon me, he's a wild man. Wild You're man. closer. What's being taught about Ishmael here is that he his hand is going to be against every man and every man's hand against him. He's going to... This is the primary... I don't know what, the primary uh, definition that allows you to identify that in Luke 21, 25, that it was Islam in the 18s and 40s and 50s that was distressing the nations. And this is the primary point of reference that allows you to say that in Revelation 11, verse 8, that the angering of the nations is brought about by Islam. Is because from the, his very DNA is marked here is that he is going to take a position against every other nation on planet Earth, and they're going to come together against him. Therefore, this becomes, this reality becomes the, the glue that upholds the correct application of a one world government being set up. When the United States goes to the world in Revelation 13, 11 through 18 and tells them they must set up an image of the beast, it does so because it still has the economic authority and the military authority over planet Earth. That's its deception. But there has to be some kind of justification that allows the United States to make the argument to the world that we need a one world government. And the prophetic justification is right here in verse 12 that Islam has created such a crisis as it is opposing all the nations of the earth that in order to rein in Islam there needs to be a one world government. This is the logic of claiming that we're on the verge of a one world government. So this, this passage here is super important. But this isn't the well of According to my marginal reference, this is the well of Birolai, is that what it's called? Down here in verse 14, Birlaho. Bir la le, 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 le What? 
really high roll. Okay. <laughs> and it's the, uh, the well of the living one who sees me. Where is it that, okay, go ahead. All right, I'm getting ready to move on to the next part of this story, but tell us about what you found about Sarah. Well, Genesis 11, um, 29, it shows that there was another name that Sarah had. You know, I don't know why you're sitting out in that room, but I don't, th I don't think we should. The only people that should sit out in those rooms are someone that is a, a student here that is a, one of these confirmed students that's never going to contribute. But as I'm traveling around, everywhere we go, there's people that are watching this live stream and they still have difficulty hearing from that mic. So I know, just a little bit I know about audio, sitting in that room, you're, you're in a cave, you've cut your ability to be heard at that mic by a measurable percentage. Okay, you're a vocal it. one of the class, you need to be in here. Okay, I'll save it for later. You'll what? I'll save it for later. You'll save it for later? Do we got open chairs? Okay. Okay. Just yeah, move just over to here. I, we're, I wasn't trying to shut you down. I'm trying to make sure the people on the web hear it. Next time. Next time. Okay, where is it that, um, that, that Ishmael is... Um, where he's fleeing? Where, where does it place him in the, in the plain of Beersheba? What chapter? We're not there. It comments on the same experience one more time. Is it seventeen? Uh, Go to chapter seventeen. Um, Okay, enough said on that. He's, he is a symbol, speaking of Ishmael, of what? Go to chapter 17. And in... We already know this story. <coughs> okay, sends him off. So let's go to... I'm missing, I'm missing a memory that I wanted to put in here, but let's go to Genesis 46. Is this the first time in Genesis 17 where circumcision was in, invoked? Is this the beginning of circumcision in chapter 17? Do we have it represented before? Um, in verse 23 of chapter 17, he comes down and that him and Ishmael are circumcised on the same day. Is this and what's the... Why are you asking? I'm just because we know circumcision is a really big part of this message relating it to the baptism of the Spirit, and I'm just wondering if, is there circumcision before Genesis 17? I'm looking through Genesis 15 where the covenant is set forth to see if it's referenced in there, and I don't see it. So the first two people circumcised were Abraham and Ishmael, is that true? I just is that what it, it says? No, I'm just wondering, and I don't know. Would that be important that those are you the know, first Paul? two people? Time. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no. Let's look at it. We're, it. It sounds right. Yeah, it sounds right to me right. too. So what? We're, What's the tie-in that Ishmael and Abraham are the first two people? Abraham at ninety-nine, Ishmael at thirteen, circumcised. Okay, that's a good point in terms of that's one of the things that I wanted to make, but I wasn't going to make it from this point. Is that he becomes a symbol of the covenant? Okay. Ishmael. Ishmael. And Abraham. And Abraham. Ishmael okay. and Abraham. But Ishmael becomes the symbol of what covenant? Of death. The covenant of death. Yeah. Why? Because he's evil. No, perhaps. Now, now aren't we told that Ishmael will be saved? Yeah, the, the, yeah, but he go to Galatians. Against his mother and mm. well, his mother and others turned against. Or Sister against White says that Ishmael will be saved. She does. Yeah, I don't have a problem. I have a, I know a quote where, and I was going to bring this up today. If at least I thought about it. He came back and helped me bury his father. Yeah, it's, she has a statement where he says he returned to the faith of his father. Okay, so, but if you go to Galatians. <coughs> but as a symbol, you represent something else. 
right. the symbol of the Bond woman. Yeah, he's the symbol so. of the Bond woman. Right. And who who's the Bond woman? Hagar. Hagar. A Bond woman's a woman. A church. church. What church is the Bond church? Sin. That gets cast out. It's the foolish virgins. It's the Laodiceans get spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. He's the symbol of the foolish virgins. As, a, as contrasted with who? Abraham. Isaac, who's the child of promise, the child of faith. So Abraham circumcision is the circumcision of life, and at that level, Ishmael's is the circumcision of death, even though when they first were both circumcised, it was a legitimate circumcision, and from what we can tell, Ishmael is going to be in the kingdom of saved man. Uh, he has the same kind of thing hanging over his head, though, that David has. You got the. You've got God saying, "This is the child of promise," and Abraham trying to do it on his own power, and that's why they got married in the first place. That's why Ishmael was born in the first place, is because it's human trying to do what God said He was going to do. Right. Everyone understand that? Yep. That's the point. So what was the fruit so of Isaac? What was the fruit of Abraham and Sarah's rebellion? Ishmael. 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 So that fruit is a symbol of whatever produced it. Rebellion. And what produced it was rebellion against what? What were they rebelling against? To wait. They were refusing to wait to acknowledge they were in the tearing time and develop. What do you develop when you wait? Character, faith, the fruits. Patience. 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 Here's the patience of the saints. If you don't, if you won't wait during the tearing time and be obedient, you don't get the patience of the saints. So Ishmael, you made my point. Thank you, Paul. Ishmael is a symbol at one level of the rebellion of public evangelism from 9/11 to the Sunday Law in Adventism. From 9/11 to Sunday Law this test about public evangelism is going to take place and it's going to take place with in the history when Islam is active. Okay, so in chapter 46 of Genesis. Can I, can I say something now? Yeah. Okay, I just want to point something out about the circumcision. Abraham and Ishmael had their circumcision, but according to uh, Genesis 17, the first circumcision was to be in the child life was to be eight days after he was born. And actually, Isaac was the first one to experience that, as far as we know from the Bible. Because both Ishmael and uh, Abraham were beyond eight days of life. But so Isaac. This, this first perfect circumcision yes. that's done. With and Isaac, Isaac, that we can count from the Bible. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay. And so what I wanted to point out earlier, I'm sorry, and I'm going to interrupt you. On Genesis um, 11, 31. Uh, 31 you need to get focused, 29. my brother Michael. Listen, Genesis 11, 31. No, 29, I'm sorry. There's another name, name, name uh, mention of um, Sarah that nobody has really, I, I just discovered it. Genesis what? Genesis 11, 29. It says, <coughs> Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham was Sarai. The name of Nahor, Nahor, Nahor wife was Milcah and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Ishka. And this name Ishka, when I did a little research on it, it's another name that is um, applied to Sarah before she was married to Abraham. And I've never really heard anybody talk about it. There's really not that much information on the pioneers. I only found a couple of hits on the Silverstone um, stuff. And I don't know if that makes any implication uh, in Sarah, meaning that Sarah had three names, from Iska to Sarai and to Sarah. And the question is then would be that almost appears like she would be the, the sister of Lot and the sister of Milka. And then she would actually be more of a first cousin to um, to Abraham than actually his half sister. In the Hebrew language, the daughter and the granddaughter is used in the same way. So when he's actually telling um, Abimelech, the king, that she's half, he, you know, only half his sister, 
she could be referring to as being she's the granddaughter of my f of of my father, or how would I say that of his grandfather? I don't know if I'm explaining that right. Anyways, I just want to throw that out there if anybody knows more about it, if any if that has any meaning towards Sarah and her life. I don't know. Um, Genesis forty six. And we're passing by the story of Abraham and Isaac and the well of Beersheba. Okay. Beersheba is what we're dealing with here. Whose turn to read? Um, Go ahead. This is something about that well. Uh, I couldn't find anything, but Sikar is uh, thought to be Shechem, and Shechem is where Joseph was sent. So we're coming to the story of Joseph. Joseph was sent to Shechem to his brethren. Um, so don't know what that means, but they think the well is in Shechem. What uh, well? In the, the well of Jacob is in Shechem in the Old Testament, which is Sikar in the New Testament, supposedly. So is that in the, the uh, wilderness of Beersheba? Where's the wilderness of Beersheba it's, referenced? It, it would be south. The wilderness of Beersheba is south <clears throat> by a good ways from Sikar. Oh, um, okay. So forget it. Whose turn to read? Genesis 21. 21.14. Genesis 21.14. The wilderness of Beersheba. Okay. That Yeah, this is the... the passage that I wanted to put in the record and I couldn't find. Let's start in verse um, 13 and uh, go to verse 21. And when you get to verse 21, he's in the wilderness of Paran. What's the wilderness of Paran? What takes place? What stories? David, uh, David and Abigail. David and Abigail, but what else? <coughs> Ish oh, Ishmael is raised in the wilderness. Yeah, well, that's verse 21. Ishmael. That's what we're going to read. <laughs> what else? The, and, and we've known this for a while, but we brought it up in Wales, and it turned on some lights for Mark that opened up several chapters um, in the book of Numbers. Okay, because there's something that takes place in the book of Numbers in the wilderness of Paran. No one knows? Okay, it, it, it's the story of the, the 12 spies. Oh, really? Yeah, that's in the wilderness of Paran. Okay, so anyway, when we get to verse 21, it's going to be in the wilderness of Paran. Let's start in verse 13. Whose turn to read? Yours. Mine? <laughs> And, and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. Since Abraham is going to have two seeds, Ishmael and Isaac, okay? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, put it in on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Here's the first reference to Beersheba in the scriptures, okay? Um, and the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, and as it were a bow shot, for she said, Let not me see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and lifted up her voice, and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad to drink. Now what I'm saying is, this is the inference that the well is the well of Beersheba. Why? Because in verse 14, the last phrase, they wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And now, in verse 19, and God opened her eyes, 
And she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew, and he dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And here is the beginning of him being marked as a great archer. So the archers in the scriptures are Islam. They're the descendants of Islam. Go to Isaiah 21.17 if you don't know that. Isaiah 21.17 says and the residue of the number of the of archers the mighty men of the children of Kedar shall be diminished for the Lord God of Israel has spoken it Kedar descendant of Ishmael um, they're archers back to Genesis 21 verse 21 says and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So what you've got going on here is several things. You have Isaac and Ishmael being two seeds, but Ishmael is now being marked as an archer, and he's being associated with the wilderness of Paran and the well of Beersheba. And the wilderness of Paran becomes a symbol of 9-11. Okay, so this is this is going to tie in with Numbers 14 and 1 Samuel 25. So, the first reference to Beer Sheba is here. Beer meaning well. Sheba means the oath. This is the seven times. The Hebrew word that's going to be expressed as seven times in Leviticus 26. And in verse... 22 then, what do you have? Abimelech and Phicol. You Now you have Abraham interacting with Abimelech and Phicol and the story of the wells. And this story gets repeated a couple chapters later in ver chapter what? Um, is it 26. Chapter 26, Isaac's going to have the same interaction with Abimelech and Phicol, and it's going to be, once again, an emphasis on the well of Beersheba. And in chapter 25, just for the record, verse 12, chapter 25, verse 12, speaking of Ishmael, it says, Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian Sarah's handmaid bare unto him, and the verse 13, it says, The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, and Kedar. Okay, the secondborn of these 12 nations is Kedar. Kedar are the archers. So, the story of Beersheba is introduced in the story of the two covenants that are represented by Isaac and Ishmael and the covenant at that level is saying that we need to exercise patience during the tarrying time and trust that the Lord will bring in the Gentiles through his own ways and means as opposed to those that enter into the covenant of death during this history and go out and do public evangelism in their own strength and they produce nothing but strife um, because their offspring is going to be Ishmael and then it moves into the controversy of Abraham and Isaac and then the story of Beersheba continues on in chapter 46 and Michael would you read verse 1 through 4 and also verse 27 and Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac and God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father's father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make thee make there, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go up with thee into Egypt. And go up with thee, huh? Go down. I will go 
down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And the sons... No, that... And the sons what? Joseph. Verse 27. Oh, yes. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. So, wh what to... What does that tell you, my brother Michael? What do you see in there? Verse 2 is, is what I'm talking about. The visions there the is Mara. Mara, and it's the first reference to the Mara, the feminine of the Mare. But explain those four verses in verse 27 for us. Well, and if, you, if he can't, then we're going to ask someone else. This is during the time of the famine, and Israel is going down to meet his son, Joseph, who they just discovered was the second ruler in the land. And so he goes to Beersheba, um, and it, apparently, from the text, it appears that he was kind of worried about it, and God says, you know, don't worry about it. Um, and so he receives the Mara vision. This places him at the beginning of the binding off. Um, he receives this... Which binding off? Binding off before the Sunday law. Oh. No, actually. No, actually. Israel is right. having a vision, right? No, it wouldn't. It would place him at the midnight cry because the binding off. Ah, okay. All right. The binding off in verse twenty-seven is there's there's something with twenty-six and twenty-seven. Jacob, or sorry, yeah, Jacob travels with sixty-six souls, and then he's marked as being made up with seventy at the Sunday law. So you have 66 marking the beginning of the binding off before the Sunday law and 70 at the Sunday law, which means that Beersheba is preceding that at the midnight cry. So what? Did, you did everyone why did, follow why did, that? Why do you say 66? Verse, verse 26. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were three score and six. 66. Okay. It, it, it explicitly marks 66. And then it says, the sons of Joseph were two, and then now there were 70. So 66 plus two is 68. So Jacob and Joseph aren't included in the count. So 66 plus four is 70. So right before the Sunday law, you have 66. Here. Right there, the little mark. And then a four in the middle. And This seven, isn't what I was asking for, but okay. And 70 at the Sunday law has been made up. Therefore, the visions that he was receiving, the Mara vision and everything that came before he got to Egypt, mm -hmm. came at Beersheba, the midnight cry. And the Therefore, why are you saying the midnight cry? Why doesn't it come right here? Isn't the, the Mara in this binding out period? Well, that's Jacob. when, well, te yeah, technically, but I'm saying, I'm saying if you're looking at it chronologically, when the 66 join the... Uh, four or the other three people when the 67 people join the other three people in Egypt that takes place at the Sunday law but this event where he sees Jacob Jacob and he has a vision the Mara vision this happens before he even gets to that to that area he's he's clear in Be Beersheba so okay so I was thinking that, that you're applies. saying this is Beersheba yeah but that. yeah but yeah the Mara the Mara part of the vision would be taking place where you're, you're looking at the midnight cry as a yeah. So this is the Jacob Jacob. Yep. Yeah. Now, why, why is that important? There's a lot, a lot of reasons why that's important. Why is it important to mark Beersheba here? Because Beersheba to Dan. Ah, so it, you're saying that if this is definitely Beersheba, that this has to be Dan. Yeah. Oh, 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 which is judgment. Depending which is, which is judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can go either way. It can go either way. It can be Dan or Beersheba. What, what, it depends Dan. on what line you're looking at, yeah. actually. Which this, just got this line out. is Beersheba to Dan. Which just got mapped out, if, if this is correct. Well, judgment is this way, Mark. Three by but it can go judgment. judgment for the priests, and then it would be Dan to Beersheba. When you're considering it from a different aspect, it can be the judgment comes for the priests at the midnight cry, so then it would be Dan to Beersheba. What are you saying? Well, I was just saying that if, if this was correct, 
um, what's just been mapped out is all three of the binding offs that we've been like, primarily dealing with. You have Midnight Cry to the Sunday Lies, one, that's Beersheba to Dan, but then you have the Mara vision that precedes this Jacob Jacob call, and then the 66 before the second. How, how many binding off is Michael saying are in this illustration? Three. He's saying there's three. Right. Okay, did everyone, I bet you two may have got that. Did everyone, would everyone else have it answered that way? How many binding offs are there in this history, according to that. Michael's and evidently Tyler's logic? Tyler's just answering. No, I'm just, answering, I'm, just, I'm just following along with what his logic is here. I don't necessarily agree. Three. Three well, between. Do, you, uh, do our Brazilian brothers get this? Yeah. You're not from Brazil, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There, this is the binding off here for the priests. This is the binding off for the Levites. But from here to here, this is the binding off for the 144,000. Amen. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. How we call it the first fruits? First fruits? Yeah. yeah, you can call it the first fruit. So now you have a dilemma. You have something that you have to, at some point, figure out for yourself. And it's this. The church triumphant is manifested at the Sunday Law when it's lifted up as an ensign, right? But we're saying that this history here is a fractal of this history. So there is a, a typification of the church triumphant right here with the priests. Okay, so what's that tell you about the Levites? It tells you the same thing about the 11th hour workers. Okay, so not from the midnight cry to the close of probation would be, I mean, if you're expanding the one, you should be able to expand the other, right? Does that make sense? You're expanding from 9 11 to midnight cry to the Sunday law, so you okay, should be able to expand the Levites from midnight cry to the. Universal now the Levites is, is it something that's going on in here. But you're expanding the other. In reference to the church triumphant, you're saying so. There's okay. There's let me let aspect. me let me start at the big level. Um, who's got a computer? In I, you can limit it to Isaiah. Pass through her. Put in pass through her. I think it's like Isaiah. 56 or so, if I could turn right to it, it would be quicker, because it's the truth about the church triumphant, when it's lifted up as an ensign, there's a promise that no sinners were going to pass through her forever. Pass through her, Joel 317. Jeremiah what? Joel 317. Jeremiah 39. Jeremiah 39? That's not it. What are you saying Joel. again? Joel. Joel. Joel 317. Shall no strangers pass through her anymore? Yeah, and Isaiah says the same thing. Okay, all right. So, what's a stranger? It's a, a Gentile. And a Gentile is a nation that's separated from the Lord. And in Isaiah 56, I think, or 54 through 58 in that neighborhood, it's telling the same story. When the 11th hour workers come into the church triumphant and stand with God's people, are they going to come in and stand with them and stand righteously for the Sabbath and then the next day fall into sin and go a few days in sin and repent? No. So the, the 11th hour workers, they're coming in and when they come in, they're sealed for eternity? As they come in. As they come in. They come in progressively, but they don't come in and have this experience of Sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent, right? That's what I think. That's, that's what's inferred in the scriptures. I, I, also, I also think that the, I mean, I've, I've thought about this before, and I think part of the reason why that's possible is that you have, now excuse me if people get offended with this guy, but Paul Washer, there's people like Paul Washer that from human perception, when you see this guy, he is preaching our message, except he's a Baptist and believes in the you know, immortality of the soul. But he's preaching a lot of aspects of what we already understand as Adventists. So you have people who already know the experience that you're supposed to have, 
with Christ, and you say this. Forget. That I don't know who that guy is you're talking about, but let's just say he's the woman at the well. He's it, the Samaritan woman. Yeah, but but you also you have people. My point is, you have people who have uh, in, in the time of the end. There's a statement that's made, um, and it's that you can have the prophetic message without the experience, and you can have the experience without the prophetic message. So there are people who have the experience of struggling to overcome sin. There are millions of them in the world, I'm sure, but they have not the prophetic truths. So when they get the prophetic message, that's all they. That's the last thing they need. Okay, I agree, and that that's the point of you got a dilemma here, whether you've not noticed it before or not. The dilemma is, is that it's pretty clear that the eleventh hour workers, they're coming in the church triumphant as wheat. Because Sister White defines the church militant as wheat and tares. And she says when they're separated, you got the church triumphant. Oh, but the scriptures true. say is that there's no more any tares pass through the church triumphant anymore forever. Yeah, I see so so the, the 11th hour workers, they're coming in at, at one level as wheat. Okay. Now, I'm not denying that they're going to have to have a three-step testing process in this history, and when they make their stand for the truth, that's going to be resolved simultaneously through the Lord's providence, whatever. But that's not the dilemma. What's the dilemma? The dilemma is you can't have a binding off where the tares fall away first when there are no tares in the church to fall away from. Now, what's the, first the point place? of having a binding off in the 11th hour? Or is that not your dilemma? If they're coming in as wheat, no and they've been, and as they come in, they're sealed. They're binding off. Isn't the it? binding off and the separation of the wheat yeah. and the tares in that class of people seems kind of like an awkward. Yeah, it's like a progressive. It's like a progressive. It, happens, not it a, almost happens as it, you know, wheat tares. Yeah. Okay, that that so. might be, but that's not the dilemma I'm dealing with. Oh, the dilemma is, is that that means the Levites that come and stand with the priests, same story. The Levites are they're going to be a testing process for the Levites where there are foolish and wise Levites that are going to go through a three-step testing process. But when they reach the conclusion of their test and they stand with the priests, they're standing for eternity. I think Patrick, while he was here, um, made an argument that we can mark the, tri the church triumphant at the midnight cry. That That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you, you can. For, for certain, the, the priests here are, are typifying the church triumphant here. That's my point. If this is so then it means when the Levites come out and stand with them, oh, there's a, there's a, they've of, went through their individual three-step testing process. Does that well, make that binding off go away then? Yeah, it kind of undoes the logic that we've been laying out. I think that's a dangerous path to go down and mentally. But you see, because it, if you apply it to 9-11, then in other words, if every aspect is the same of the bigger picture, then at 9-11, got people doing the priests have to be doing the same thing have to be doing the same thing what they're 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 sealed right then because what you're no saying, no no this is they're the, joining this this this, this is group. the church militant yeah, it's what's the point of a binding off a litmus test when you don't even need it because you're automatically already just ready and ripe doesn't she say, technically that's the church militant no. too because Wait, the yeah, midnight cry of the Sunday law because they're Adventists, they're the church and they're militant, you know? Yeah. On a big scale. Okay. This is dangerous. This isn't dangerous, this is a dilemma. It's there. Uh, I'm not telling you I have the answer for it, but I guarantee that this is being, this concept is being opened up and it's not dangerous. It's, it's dangerous to not investigate it because you're worried that it's dangerous, all right? The Lord is opening up something that we haven't thought about before. The promise is, is He's going to finish what He starts. So it's not dangerous, it's His leading. Ezra 7 9. Ezra 7 9. When Ezra's coming out of Babylon and you figure out He's got the priest, but He's got no Levites, what they do, they, they call the priest to go to the Nethanims to basically call the to call the Levites, and so that's basically marked at 9/11, at the first day of the first month, first day of the first month. So right there, you already see the calling and a, and a gathering together. And and I we talked about the Nethanims probably representing the 11th hour workers. Yeah, but is it right at 9/11, or is it 12 days later when he stops by the river Ahava? 
that he sends them back in. No, by the 12th day they leave. The first day that he arrives there, he remains three days. He arrives at the river Ahava. They, they, leave, they leave Israel. I mean, they leave Babylon. Babylon the first day of the first month. They, they, they arrive at the, uh, the, uh, the river Ahav, Ahava. And that's when he does for three days. They stop and they recognize they have no Levites. And that's when they say... When do they arrive at the river Ahava? I think the first day. Yeah, I've looked into this... Yep. Okay, so they're at Ahava here. That's not a problem. And then they stay for three days. Yep. Okay. And then they, and then well, I don't know when they send out for the priest. Where, where's the twelve days in there? There's the twelve days. Yeah, there's a. They leave at the twelfth day. So what happens is they leave what? There's a gathering. They leave Ahava at the twelfth day. But the first three days. The first three days of that. What, what happens is they, they tarry at the river Ahava for three days, and either during that three days or at the end of the three days, Ezra says, hey, we're, we're the priests and Levites, we need, or we're the priests, we need to get them in here. And so then they send for them, it takes time to go gather them, apparently seven or eight days, and then, and then they leave. Or um, they days. leave on the twelfth day. They leave on the twelfth day. Yeah, so basically right here it says that, in, 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 and I gathered them together to the river that ran into Ahava, and their abode we intense three days, and I viewed the people and the priests and found there were none of the sons of Levi. So he did some sort of a numbering, took yeah. him three days to number the people, and that's when he recognized there were no Levites. Okay, the point I want to get to, and you're there, maybe you can read it. What... There's several things in here. What, one of the things that she's referring to is that the priests are there, they got to get the Levites, but the Nethanims are already there. But there's two other classes of people there. Singers and porters. Yeah, but those are part of the, the Levites. Yeah, that's, that's a good way just to generalize them and not see but, any distinction in them. I get that part. But we're seeing the distinction in the Nethanims and the priests and the Levites, and you may be right that the porters and the singers are, are all Levites. It's part of what the Levites do, so you just treat them as a, a, a category. But there are five groups of people marked here. One's well, a priest, three are Levites, of, and the one is a Nethanim. In the light of the sanctuary, you've got the priests that were allowed to look on, upon the holy things. You have the Levites that were allowed to, to handle the, the work to help the priests. And then you had the Nethanims that helped the Levites to carry on the work. And the Levites, part of the worship or the sanctuary worship, they had to be singers. And yep. they had to have so... Porters. Yes. Carry the stuff. Yep, I get that. So priests, Levites, Nethanims. Why did we go here? Oh, the binding off. Binding off. We raised this dilemma. You have to figure this out because the, this, this binding off for the, the Levites... Uh, if, if it takes, if it comes to here, if this is where it takes place for all of them, if this is the third test for the Levites, then it means that from here to here, it, uh, what I'm saying is this, even though there are two classes of Levites in this history, based upon the testimony of the church triumphant, the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy, the priests have already established a typification of the church triumphant. There's no way that foolish Levites come into that church during that history. This might be a reason why um, there's an illustration of the bigger picture of Midnight Cry of the Sunday Law, because during this time, yeah, this is a binding off period. Yes. These, the priests have already been bound off. It's not, yeah. And what's getting binding off in here is the Levites. Yeah. We're putting it down here, but we're acknowledging it, it's here. Yeah. So all, all I'm saying is whether you get it or not, what I'm bringing to your attention is that it's pretty clear, in my mind at least, that the 11th hour workers that come and stand with the 144,000 when they come into the church triumphant, they're sealed. Their yeah. character is set. So what's the point of the image of the beast test to test you if you're just going to immediately see it and join in a pure church? No, that's, that's my point. I didn't say that. It, he recorded it. You can go check it. Um, let's say the first person to accept the message, let's give him the name of Cornelius. 
I don't know how to spell it. But the heat, Cornelius is the first one that comes in in AD 34. So he's the first. Okay, there's going to be a last, whoever that is. So he's get, it's not being consistent with what we already teach is that the, the judgment is progressive. He's being tested first. Okay, he's, um, he's confronted with the message of the Sabbath. That's his first test. He's going to see the 144,000. That's his visual test that are standing in this testing process. And because he's been plowed, he's been given the information to understand this crisis, he, he determines, I'm going to stand with these people. He's bound off, he's joined with these people, and now number two. It's tested, it's progressive. That's consistent with how we understand each nation being tested. You know, uh, as it goes through South America, it, these people are going to be tested, and that's one, two, three for them, but then Zimbabwe has got its test later down the road. Same test. But, may, but Zimbabwe and, and Colombia may go through it, that test at the identical time. Simultaneously, yeah. So Cornelius and number two can be going through it at the We're identical time. Have millions of people going through it at the exact yeah. same yeah. time. But you can yeah. fail on exactly. the second part. Yeah, you can because fail in here and choose, no, I'm not going to stand with these lunatics. They're right. out in left field. And you fail and you, right there, you close your door. But the first step when you agreed with them on their religious liberty that they should be able to worship on Sabbath, then you're saying they're not really a part of it, they're just making a decision, they're in a decision process, they're not really joining the church when they take that first step to say they should be able to worship on Sabbath. They're watching, the, right here, the first Sunday law hits. National apostasy followed by national ruin. The United States is crippled, it escalates. They're watching the whole argument over Sabbath and Sunday. So they've, they've already settled in their mind here they're, they've already that conclusion is made. I, I don't I don't know I don't know how to describe it. I just know it's there. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm saying that the evidence is that the eleven dollar workers when they come and stand with the hundred and forty four thousand they are sealed. Okay, so we we kind of put the binding off in a singular little box at the end that seems to be progressive. If this is true, then the same kind of thing is probably going to take place among the Levites. We have to end. It's eight o'clock. Jeff. Yes. That's going to be our experience now too. Every day we must be passing the test, but when we get there, we're not part of it. That's and right. The same with the other people that don't know. Is that every day they have to pass the test that they brought to them? That seems to kind of destroy that body off there for the Levites. Why? Well, what's the, what's the point of it if they've already been bound off? You know, every person has already been bound off. That might just be illustrating just a couple people. It doesn't destroy it. It just says it's it's more on from midnight crowd of the Sunday law, and it just moves it out. Moves it out, but we I guess it's not. I mean, the whole thing. Well, then we lose the structure of Revelation nine. Yeah. We or not lose it necessarily, but it, you know that no, illustration. No, 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 that no, no, Revelation nine is giving you two witnesses to what this binding off is. No, I know there's a conflict there. There's a serious conflict. Yeah, I don't know if it's a conflict. You and Brahman. It, Seem it's, it's to put dilemma. it in destroy, dangerous, no, it's a conflict. It's a, it's a, it's a dilemma. dilemma. The yeah. line of the tribe of Judah is opening it up because he wants to lead us through this unknown region. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had together today in learning the truths in your word. Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to lead and guide each one of our minds. Father, continue to lead us ultimately to your truth that you would have us to know. Help us each on our own to study and um, see what, what truths you have for us to, and then ultimately to bring together, Lord, to, so that we can move forward. Please be with each one of us today and um, guide each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.